Thank you, Chris. And um, I'm just now going to start sharing my screen, but but thank you, Chris, and thank you, Nancy and Linda, for inviting Ruth and me um, to join you this afternoon. There is nothing that makes me more happy than sharing art with people, which is the basic job of a museum. And um, it's very exciting for me, especially to learn about the Washington Print Club, um, which is new to me, but um, I hope to you know, remain in contact. And I hope that you will all also you know, come visit us at Woodmere. Um, Body Language, The Art of Larry Day is up and on view until I wanna say the very last week of January, 2022. So you've got time um, to come up here and visit. Although, um, you know, as you mentioned, Chris, the exhibition takes place um, across three venues at Woodmere, which, as I said, is on view through the end of January, um, but also at the University of the Arts and at Arcadia Exhibitions. And those exhibitions um, close to the public at the beginning of December. So if you really want the full treatment of Larry Day um, and you're inspired by this presentation, come visit us um, in November. Um, but also know that um, you can come to Woodmere through December and January as well. And um, we have a gallery that um, encompasses the um, sort of an overview of the entirety of the exhibition that takes place across um, three spaces. And as well, um, there are works of art such as dialogue, which you see on the screen now um, on the left half of, of the screen. I hope everybody can see a work that comes late, um, you know, in Larry Day's career, and it encompasses, you know, a great deal of, you know, the material that kind of is spread across the three venues. And so um, at Woodmere, we are presenting the figurative work of Larry Day. He his he's you know perhaps best known for paintings that are um, figurative ensembles of um, characters that, um, in, in to, to a great extent, come out of his life experiences. Um, and you see, you know, Larry Day seated there. He's the figure on the right with the eyeglasses. And um, he is in dialogue with a fellow named Merv Richard, um, who not only um, owns the painting together um, with his wife, Judith, but um, he's depicted there, um, you know, in conversation with Larry. Merv, some of you may know, is a conservator at the National Gallery of Art and was a friend of Larry Day's. And we started with this painting because it's a construction site um, in Washington, DC. I think Ruth said she believed it was a construction site on 7th Street, not far from the National Gallery of Art at all. And the painting is very much about the interaction between these two figures. And um, it's a, this is a large painting. When you stand in front of it, you can't miss the center of activity here, which is two figures with very different emotional projections through their body language. Hence our title, um, Larry Day, an artist um, um, in 1992. Um, he's been practicing for many decades. He's an artist, you know, that, that um, creates art from his from his soul, but his mind. And um, he shows himself deeply immersed. Um, Merv, you know, has a completely different kind of body language. He's, he's gesturing with his hand. He's, um, you know, he's, he's speaking with a smile. Um, and, and um, you know, it's the coming together of these two, you know, very opposite expressions of human thought that you know is placed in the context of this very geometric construction site and again you know what's wonderful about the work of larry day is that these paintings become deeper and more complex as they sink into you as you're looking at them and so um you you start to notice that their legs are crossed that their shoes are almost touching and that there are all kinds of x-shaped relationships throughout this painting, like the X shapes 
you know, in the building on, uh, you know, under construction above them. And so the, the picture starts to echo and resonate and become bigger. And it, um, it you know, it, it's, it's almost like, you know, you throw a, a little stone into a still pond and the echoes of the shape start to reverberate. And that's to me very much the experience of the work of Larry Day and what makes it so intellectually satisfying, but also, um, you know, from from the perspective of just, um, you know, a work of art that that that, you know, conveys and engages you through the 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 beauty of the work. You know, this is an artist who can get so much um, applying paint in a thin kind of way. Ruth will, I'm sure, describe, you know, Larry's um, painting methods. But, um, you know, here's here's an artist who can really rope you in to the conversations that he's creating between figures and he ropes you in through um, the beauty and complexity of of the work um, that he presents and the the deep intellectual investment that he brings to his paintings and and again um, you know in our exhibition this is the first painting you'll encounter in the large um, gallery space um, that houses the exhibition and um, we chose it because it is so iconic um, in the sense of capturing so much um, about Larry Day's work that's expressed across um, the three venues so that you know that that's a little bit about Larry Day in you know a quick nutshell from this you know one very spectacular painting that has everything to do with Washington DC and actually lives in a private collection in Washington. Um, I thought I would just take a minute and introduce Woodmere Art Museum to all of you. Um, Woodmere is a museum that has existed since the well it was founded in the 1890s. Um, it was a private museum up until the late 1930s. In 1940, it became a charitable 501c3. We are located in a you know, very beautiful stone mansion in a neighborhood called Chestnut Hill. And you see our Victorian tower there um, off on the right. I'm sitting in my office, which is that bay window you see just over the porch. Um, that's, those are the windows that are straight ahead of me. Um, and, you know, one of the special things about Woodmere, you know, we not only have, you know, a collection and galleries that are dedicated to um, the art of Philadelphia and Woodmere's collection is one of the great collections of um, American art. Um, for those of you who are deeply immersed in the universe of prints, um, we have a very great print collection with strong representation of, you know, the great printmakers of Philadelphia artists like Benton Spruance and Robert Riggs, um, but then also on the modernist side, especially Earl Horder, great printmaker, Arthur Carls, Woodmere, I believe Woodmere has the only full collection of all the prints made by Arthur Carls. We also have um, his copper printing plates here. And, um, um, and, and, you know, aside from the world of, of prints, um, Philadelphia is one of the you know, very distinguished um, cities in the, you know, in the history of American art. Um, we have six green acres um, where we're about to do a big expansion and we will have 10 green acres. And um, over the last 10 years, we've been populating our grounds with extraordinary works in sculpture. And you see in the foreground on the left in this photograph, a sculpture known as the free interpretation of plant forms by the artist Harry Bertoya. And it's an interactive sculpture. You're invited to walk into that cave that you see there facing outward and listen to the pitter pat of the water as it um, cascades over the sculpture's surface. And so we offer, you know, a wonder, I, I believe a wonderful experience of art and nature um, together across the grounds of Woodmere. And, you know, I, I encourage you to please come and visit and, you know, if you'd like to, to you know, do, a, you know, a, an organized trip um, in person, you know, from Washington, D.C., from the Print Club to see the Larry Day Show, and, and I encourage you to do that, um, you know, I'd be very glad to, you know, either meet with you or organize my, you know, very best docents to give you a tour or, you know, to please come. We would 
we would love to see you there. So that's enough about Woodmere. Um, this is our large rotunda shaped gallery that opened to the public in the year 1910. It was designed by an architect named George Howe, who's one of the great modernist architects of 20th century Philadelphia. And um, it's one of the beautiful exhibition spaces of, of, of our city. And you can see the Larry Day show. Um, I wanted to give you a sense of the scale of the paintings. Um, this is a photograph from the opening event. And um, you can see um, there, you know, sort of in the left, in the background there, the painting dialogues, which I was showing you. But this gives you a sense of, you know, just what does the exhibition look like? Um, and, and really, you know, my last slide before I introduce Ruth Fine is to say that when I arrived at Woodmere 11 years ago, um, this painting called Poker Game by Larry Day was hanging in the office of my director of education. And I did not know Larry Day's work before, but as I was, you know, attending meetings and talking to my education director, you know, the, the painting really sucked me in. And I became so interested in, you know, who are these people? And I learned that they are specific people. And I learned, you know, about each of them individually. It intrigued me to no end to learn that this was an actual poker game that continues to this day and began in the 1960s. Larry Day participated in the poker game. That's his chair there um, in the foreground that's empty. So, um, uh, you know, he's, he's absent, but also present. And of course it's, you know, his vision of this scene. I started to learn about the specificity of everything that's going on there. You know, each of these figures is an artist um, with impressive contributions, um, you know, through their through their art. Um, but there's also a specificity like this, you know, this octagonal gaming table was born was was purchased, I learned by the artist Jimmy Luters, who's the fellow in the yellow sweatshirt um, at Wanamaker's department store. And it was the very um, it was the very um, table that they used for this um, poker game. And the reason I'm getting into the details here and you know what I wanna say about the arts of Philadelphia and Larry Day and why Larry Day is so important to Woodmere as a museum dedicated to the arts of Philadelphia is that you know, while Philadelphia has a very important and distinguished history um, with American modernism. So I, I mentioned Earl Horder and, and Arthur Carls earlier, who are important modernists who brought, you know, European modernism, Cubism, Futurism, Fauvism, you know, they lived in Paris, they came to Philadelphia, they exhibited here, they exhibited in New York, and they were vehicles for bringing modernism to the United States. I would say that the mainstream of the arts as they involved, as they evolved in, in Philadelphia, you know, have to, has to do with realism and representation in the arts. And there are some reasons for this, um, but, you know, if you think about the artists of Philadelphia, um, you know, starting with the Peel family, coming up through Thomas Aikens and into the 20th century, the realist tradition in the arts is very strong in Philadelphia. And, you know, Thomas Aikens advocated you know, you paint what you see in front of you. That was a cornerstone of, you know, his idea of what it means, you know, and, and you know, forgetting the term realism as, you know, Courbet and a category of art and a movement, but as a principle, the idea that you paint what's in front of you, of, you know, you, you, uh, it's that the art emerges from what you see and what you experience um, is something that the artists of Philadelphia um, hold very viscerally, and, and I believe some of the modernists do as well, and there's some interesting dialogues there. Um, however, you know, what's so important to me about Larry Day is that he takes this history of realism in the arts in Philadelphia, a history that goes back to the Peels and Aikens and then Violet Oakley in the earlier parts of the 20th century, and, and he's a major voice in reinterpreting what realism and figuration and representational art means or can mean um, as a vocabulary and as um, 
you know, as a mode for creating meaning through art. And again, as I'm sure Ruth will um, describe later, um, you know, Larry Day was known as the Dean of Philadelphia painters. He was an extremely important teacher in the arts. He was just simply gifted in that area. He was a natural born teacher. And so there are generations of, and by this I mean thousands of artists practicing, you know, in America today, whose who's, um, you know, who, who take a piece of Larry Day forward um, with them because he had such a profound impact as a teacher and as somebody who made images that just draw people in and have, um, you know, and, and, and that have lasting power. And so an image like, you know, this poker game, um, you know, I described Larry Day earlier in that painting called Dialogues as somebody where, you know, the intellectual dimension of what's being depicted is a big part of um, the, the engagement that a viewer has. You know, here we are, a poker game, um, the figure in the center with the blue jacket is moving his hands and shuffling cards there. Um, you know, when you stand in front of the painting, he's the center of gravity in so many ways. He's sort of there in, at the central axis, but I always imagine he's placing a bet and everyone else is, you know, focused on him and internally focused on how am I going to react to this thing that's happening there? And it's that kind of dynamic um, sort of intellectual thought process kind of happening within the sphere of the painting that to me just makes Larry Day's work get better and better and more intriguing and more intriguing the more I immerse myself in it. And I would say that one of the real pleasures of having this exhibition on view is talking to other people about these paintings because, you know, as much as for me, you know, I see certain anchoring elements in each of the works that I know well, what I find when I'm talking to other people that they see other parts of the paintings that engage them and that the dialogue about the painting for them starts in different places and in different ways. And that's been incredibly exciting, you know, for me to see. But, you know, that's also the nature of art that, you know, different people have different takes and have different emotional experiences and reactions to the art. And part of what makes Larry's work so powerful to me is that it speaks to so many people in so many different ways and is so open to posing the kinds of questions and mystery the kind of mystery that you get for example from you know that that empty chair i mean it's a you know it's the sort of folding chair we probably all you know or maybe a lot of us have you know a couple of those folding chairs for emergency purposes in a closet somewhere in our house or in the basement and yet it becomes an object that's so pregnant with meaning because of what it represents as an object. And then of course we know, I'm sure that was an actual folding chair that really looked like that. So um, I'm gonna stop myself there and say that, you know, another great um, privilege that comes with um, presenting an exhibition of the work of Larry Day is that, um, that Larry Day's work has a strong connection and Larry Day's greatest champion on this planet is my friend Ruth Fine. And, um, you know, Ruth has um, an intimacy with this work that is unparalleled. And it's a real treat and a pleasure for all of us um, to be here today with Ruth. So with that, Ruth, I'm gonna turn to your first slide and your introduction. Um, to Larry, and I'm going to put myself on mute um, and hand it over to you. Well, thank you, Bill. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everybody who's here. I see a number of familiar names and faces out there, and I can try and pretend we're really in a real space uh, with each other. Uh, Larry, Larry was born in 1921. He died in 1998. He lived in Washington from 1985 to 1995. And the curator for this exhibition was the British art historian, David Bindman, who um, 
I got to know in the 70s when I was working on Blake and David was working on Blake and he and Larry became very close friends over the years so that while I'm speaking, it's really David's show and COVID kept him from coming to this country as much as he might have from London, but we were sending an images back and forth and that's how the show actually happened. It's amazing that it was able to happen at this particular time. Both Chris and Gil mentioned that it's a three-part exhibition and the three parts are called uh, Nature Abstracted and this would be a sense of nature abstracted. Silent Conversations, which is what the Merv, Larry images and Absent Presence, which is what a group of um, um, architectural or landscape images are about. So they're the three segments of the show and it, it, it has worked out very well to have the three segments. It's great to see them up all at once. And, you know, this seems like the perfect painting for the macho abstract expressionist uh, period of the 60s, 50s. Larry was anything but macho, but he was clearly uh, proud of being in his studio surrounded by this work. Um, and most of the abstractions he did are one way or another rooted in either figurative compositions or nature. His primary uh, influences, I would say early on were de Kooning, later on Gustin, or I don't know if influences or correspondences. His best friend among this group was um, Franz Klein, who taught at the at PCA, Philadelphia College of Art, now the University of the Arts, where these paintings are hung uh, in the early 50s. And Larry and he remained in touch with each other until the end of his life. Uh, let's do the next slide. I'm going to have to move fairly quickly through this. Uh, Larry was born in Philadelphia. Much of his work is connected to issues of self-portraiture, and that will become obvious as we go along, but I thought it would be a treat to see a painting of him as a child and a painting of him, I mean, a photograph of him as a child and a painting of him based on that photograph. And you can see all kinds of changes, the scale of the head, uh, the nature of the light. Uh, people have talked about Larry's um, technique whether he was working in watercolor or oils, he tended to paint thinly. Even a painting like the abstraction you saw previously is also thinly painted. I think of him as being the artist um, who did more with less material than any other artist I can think of. He, he never was a thick artist painter. And I guess I should say, I met him when I was a uh, sophomore in art school in around 1959-60 and was told by the my sculpture teacher you're never going to be a sculptor but I think you'll be a painter and I'd like you to meet the best painter in the school and march me up to meet Larry Day so that's when I met him we didn't get married until I was in my 40s and he was in his 60s so my admiration for the work took place long before um, my connection with the man. <laughs> uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, he, he, his was a working class family. He had to take the commercial course in uh, high school. There was no way he was going to be able to go to college except for the GI Bill. And he was in the Pacific campaign. He was in an army battalion that um, led the Marines onto Iwo Jima. He was there when the flag was raised. He was the librarian at Iwo Jima. Uh, and even as a child or as a young man, he was an intellect, despite the fact that I never had the sense there were very many books in his home. He often talked about he was, how he was the first person to read the second volume of the biography of Keats. He was the only one who had taken it out of the library. And he wrote throughout his life. When he got out of the army, he really wasn't sure what to do, and I think his first thought was to be a, um, a writer. And he had been accepted at Kenyon College to study with John Crow Ransom. I have a book of poems he wrote during the war, and he also wrote a novel 
that he uh, destroyed. I never saw it. Uh, but starting when he was in art school, he um, started publishing. And in this issue of the Temple Owl, he ended up going to Tyler School of Art because his um, connection to Kenyon wasn't to start until the fall. And so some friends of him said, well, you know, don't waste your time just hanging out, start at Tyler. And he loved being at Tyler, which was the art school of Temple University. And um, often said how that was the first time he really felt at home in his life, surrounded by people who were artists and writers. But he also studied the um, education courses as well. And, and he was a devoted teacher as well as a devoted writer and a devoted painter. And during, let's do the next slide, Bill, please. During the course of my working on the show, I, I really came to realize that um, I think writing was as important to him as painting. Um, he also was very involved with acting and that's him on the left. Uh, he was an, an actor at Tyler and an actor at the Cheltenham Art Center, which was an important uh, art venue in suburban Philadelphia, which was where he lived for most of his life. He lived in the same home uh, from the time he was 12 years old until he moved to Washington in 1995, 1985. Uh, so he wasn't, a, he wasn't a, a real mover around and traveler. And again, a self-portrait from the time he was in art school. Uh, and let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, this was a painting that previously was in the James Boot collection of self-portraiture in Washington and was shown both at the Portrait Gallery and um, at Georgetown University at a certain point. And the Goot collection was obviously disseminated, or at least this painting wasn't purchased by a Philadelphia artist. But it seems to me to show several aspects of uh, what Larry was involved with. There's a, an Italian Mannerist painter at the left, painting at the left, the Northern Mannerist painting at the right. He's working from the nude, which is very much what his teaching was about. He, so far as I know, never had models at his own. He worked from the news at school. And the woman standing behind him was a student of his who, with whom he remained close um, through the rest of his life. But the two paintings very much introduce his sense that art was universal and eternal. And he spoke of himself as being a rear guard painter, not an avant-garde painter. Um, although he was very fully aware of the avant-garde and was actually in a panel with Duchamp, the leader of the avant-garde in our century in our country, um, when he was teaching. But you'll see various ways in which his connection with old master painting uh, takes place. Uh, throughout what I will be saying to you. This is a table that is sitting right next to me, which his father probably built. His father uh, was a craftsman in terms of building furniture. Uh, let's do the next slide, please. So this is the painting in which that little boy was used. And this is Larry painting himself as, as a child. Uh, this is a drawing. There are many, many drawings related to this painting. This one is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And the one on the left, uh, the painting is in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. It was selected for the museum by Ann Temkin after Larry died. She felt this was the painting of among those in the estate that she wanted. Um, and I just recently gave all of the other drawings that I had related to it to the Philadelphia Museum of Art in memory of Joe Rischel, who you all may have met when he was uh, in Washington for a CASVA um, fellowship several years ago. One of the interesting things here is the question of whether this is a painting or a view out a window. And uh, Bill talked earlier about how everyone brings a different reading to the work. And, and that's true, but also Larry very much believed that the work was completed by the viewer and that until the viewer was viewing and responding that uh, the work really didn't um, 
have its culmination. And so that's not only, it's not only the, that it happens, it's that he intended for it to happen, that everything had the potential of multiple readings. Next slide, please, Bill. He did do figurative work before he did abstract work. And I think this is the actual only print I'll be showing you. The um, installation at Arcadia has a, a gallery of prints, some of them related to painting, some of them related to drawings. And the reason for that at Arcadia is that just as Larry was called the Dean of Philadelphia Painters, Benton Spruance was called the Dean of Philadelphia Printmakers. And Benton Spruance was an early director, if not the founder of the um, Beaver College, which is now Arcadia uh, Art Department. And um, lithography was the only printmaking process they taught there. And I was amazed to learn this week that now they don't teach lithography at all. They only teach etching and screen printing, which they didn't do until I taught there in the late 60s after Ben died. But you can see that the print is in reverse of the um, painting. And Woodmere will eventually have a complete set of Larry Day prints. Most of them took place in the 50s a few in the 40s when he was a student, and very few later on. There are some woodcuts. Larry dated almost nothing and titled almost nothing unless it was exhibited. So there are a lot of circus um, throughout the exhibition and throughout the catalog. And by the way, there is a beautiful catalog published by University of uh, Pennsylvania Press, which I hope Bill will have Andy and be able to show you um, and it's distributed by the University of Pennsylvania Press and it has several prints um, included in it. So Bill, let's move on. I'm gonna have to move quickly because we need, oh, all right, this is also another, I've forgotten this was here. This is another uh, two prints related to a drawing. And what I find particularly important about these two prints is that the bottom one, the lighter one is state two, the upper one is state one. And so in order to complete his image, and again, they're in reverse of the drawing, in order to complete his image, he removed material. And this was so much how he painted. He would lay paint in and remove paint. He was very interested in the surfaces of frescoes and interested in the surfaces of tapestries. And both of those influence the kind of surfaces that uh, we see in his paintings. But the idea of the importance of removing the lithographic material um, was, was critical. So far as I know, he printed all of his prints himself. He was not a great printer, but he was not a terrible printer either. Um, let's go to the next one, please. Uh, to Pergamum was perhaps his first attempt at um, returning to figuration once he'd moved into abstraction. And of course, its title is related to the Pergamum altarpiece. And so a figurative source of abstraction and journey on the right um, and a, a landscape source of abstraction. And so it's, it's fascinating to see these two, two roots of abstraction as you move through the work. Next, Bill, please. The Pergamon painting was the subject of a book article he wrote in 1958 for, 19, for an art education grouping. So, so starting in 48, he was writing as a student. Starting in 58, he was writing as a professional. He wrote many articles about um, about specific paintings, um, which uh, many of them were published. Uh, here are two examples of his work after old master paintings, one after Veronese, which I do believe is dated around the 60s based on other stylistic matters and much later after Poussin. I would say Poussin was one of the critical people. Um, to him in um, working from the old masters. Next, Bill, please. 
Um, but Spain, this painting was the one that shifted him into representational painting. While the Pergamon was 1958, this is 1962. And he never painted an, another abstract painting after he did this painting. And he talked about how he felt he was repeating himself in the abstraction, that he would have something set up and his response would be a very similar response to this, the response he had had in his previous painting. But when he did after Stain, and aside from the Pergamum, it's the only painting I know of that's a painting after an old master painting. Generally, his drawings are after old masters and Stain was very, very important to him. Um, and he talked about making the painting and feeling that well, you could make a stroke and it would be a stroke, but it also would be a fabric fold or an edge. And the idea that the same stroke could function in multiple ways um, was very important to him uh, and for the rest of his life. Um, people question the sense of finish in his paintings, that this is a head that is not fully articulated and this is even less articulated. And my sense that one of the alternate titles for this show could have been finished enough that um, his way of working was to convey what he thought was important to convey the form or to convey the idea. And then he moved on. Let's do the next slide, please, Bill. Um, these are two drawings that very closely followed um, the after stain painting. And I don't have a painting related to these, but several drawings related to um, the bridge game. And this brings up Duchamp in here and has very specific conceptual ideas. And this seems to me to move back into a much more abstract format. This is the more abstract of any of these, um, maybe six or seven bridge game drawings. And it wouldn't be uncommon for him to do 20 drawings. And some of them were made in preparation for a work. Some of them were made while he was working on the work. And some of them were made as reflections after he finished the painting. So we tend to use the term related to rather than study for. Next, please, Bill. Games were important to him. Uh, so was pop art. This, um, this group of figures come from an ad for Monsanto, and they're part of a series of watercolors he did as well. This figure was from a um, probably a Vogue advertisement, and this may well have been similarly, but it's another painting in which you see the kind of juxtaposition of equal importance of the figurative aspects and the geometry of his structuring. And again, greater finish here, lesser finish here. There is a figure left out of the Monsanto ad. Uh, and this is, uh, this was something he traded actually to a Washington based artist named Daryl Dean, who's no longer in Washington. And Daryl uh, traded him a two-part ceramic piece, as well as uh, several hours of working. Um, and Daryl sold it to Mark Schoel. We were able to find it. Next, please. This is the catalog cover to the memory of Matteo Giovanetti, again, showing his interest in pop art and contemporary culture, the motorcycle players, um, Italian film is referenced. Matteo Giovanetti is a very little known Italian artist. Uh, and just as he was interested in obscurity in the work, he was also interested very much in obscure artists, a very thinly painted work. And I don't think I have a slide in here, but there's a small study for it. Let's go to the next bill, a uh, small study for it um, and a watercolor related to it. Continuing back with the game, with the game theme, charades was a very important work for him. And part of his methods was people would come in and he would um, ask them to take a photograph of him. And then he would incorporate that in. And this photograph, this, this pose is also in 
and other paintings. So that it was not unusual him, for him to use the same figurative um, motif in more than one work. In fact, there were three figures in the Matteo Giovanetti painting. Bill, let's go to the next one. I'm feeling we're taking too much time. The Matteo Giovanetti one that um, was painted in 1967. Those same three figures are in the last series of drawings he did in 1997. So that he was going back for 30 years to, to incorporate. Bill talked about the people in uh, the poker game um, painting. These are many of the same people. This is David Pease, who was the man in the blue jacket, who was, um, was the dean of uh, Temple University during this period and went on to be the dean at Yale. This is Dennis Leon, who was in the poker game painting as well. This is Natalie Charco, who's the teacher who introduced me to Larry. And this is a painting that is now finished, but is in this painting in, um, in its unfinished state. And when this was part of an exhibition at Woodmere a few years ago, Natalie Charco's niece ran home and brought this painting in and said, I have that painting and donated it uh, to Woodmere. So it's, it's a combination of his world, Monica Vitti, the Italian actress that um, we all were madly in love with at that particular moment. Um, so more Italian, Matteo Giovanetti, Matteo, Monica Vitti, let's go to the next. I'm gonna skip this for now, let's go to the next. This is a painting, Heidelberg Park, that's um, one of my favorite paintings in, in and, and such a, a strange combination again of uh, place, Heidelberg Park and figures, this wonderful dog looking over to the left, this wonderful figure looking over to the right, uh, very thinly painted. Um, what is going on? It's a tourist painting. And he did a tourist painting in the early 60s as well. So it was a theme that was important to him. The image of this tree is the kind of tree that Larry painted all the time. He spoke of himself and said, he said, I'm not a colorist, but the truth of the matter is when you see this installation at Woodmere, uh, he was an extraordinary colorist, next please. Uh, but his own focus was on drawing in many respects. Here is Mervyn. Larry, again, I won't discuss it, but here is the construction um, painting done a little bit earlier, uh, but possibly closer again. The Circa is a guess on my part of Washington construction site as it was taking place. Next, please. And then the three worlds. This is right around the corner from the National Gallery on, I think it's Indiana Avenue. Um, but the reference here, of course, is to Dante's three worlds, the underground world, the level world, and presumably the sky. He was very, very uh, engaged by skyscape, something, again, that I think I learned while looking at the show and seeing how beautifully he attended to skies. Uh, next, Bill. And this is the a painting construction site um, that is in the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts collection. But these are two drawings that I gave them presumably with those titles or they constructed those titles. But clearly when I saw them in the exhibition, they are not drawings for the painting. They are drawings after the painting. He would never do two drawings so alike and stay with that when he did the painting. Uh, it just wouldn't happen that there would be two drawings that much like a painting without any, I mean, this is not in there, but so this idea of when drawings are done and how one titles them um, becomes an issue. Okay, Bill, next please. Um, just to show the range of his drawings and watercolors, this is Arboretum that's in a, Washington private collection, Carol Kelly, you all may know her. Uh, this is very near both Arcadia and not that far from Woodmere. This was at the corner of 
Larry's home, so that his home would be about here and he would be looking at that. He used every range of material on paper um, and generally in combination. Next, Bill, please. And, and this is in here really to bring up his issue as, as a teacher. He would often draw in the class with the students. Um, all, there is a group of about 30 oral histories that were made in relation to this exhibition. And um, what virtually any of them that were made by his students or people who knew, them as a young, knew him as a young artist say is that Larry taught them to talk. To, to think, sorry, and talk probably also to articulate the ideas that they were thinking. He was not someone who wanted a coterie of followers. He was someone who wanted to develop his own um, rear guard sensibility and wanted them to develop whatever guard sensibility they wanted to develop. Uh, next, Bill. This is his studio, one of his studios where you see reproductions of paintings and books and uh, things that were made by friends. So it was always not only a space to work, although there's a working table, but you can, you can see the kinds of things he would be looking at while he was working. Next, please. And these just to reference his writings in the catalog, there is a piece about Poussin and there's a piece about uh, Matisse with these reproduced in it. That's the range of uh, what he was interested in writing about. There's a fascinating piece about uh, Rauschenberg uh, in there as well. So that he went back in history and wrote as well about his contemporaries. Next, please. And this is a very late drawing, difficult, I think, to see clearly. I hope you can. Um, the very latest drawings tend to be primarily pen and ink with no, draw no drawing under underpinning it, uh, no preparatory drawing. And they came together as drawn collages. And just as I mentioned that, I don't know if I did mention that Temple Owl story that was published was about someone being in a hotel room with a lion in the next room. It's a totally surreal story that he wrote in 1948, but that was three years after he got out of the army. And these incredibly surreal drawings that he did at the end of his life, I think take him back to the complexity of the army experience and the chaos of the army experience. Um, because during the last decade of his life, he did go to army reunions every year. They were very important to him. And so I've known other veterans who came back and World War II became critical to um, them very, very late in life in their 70s and 80s and 60s. And so I think that's part of what this three-headed figure and the factories and the I don't know what that is, but it relates to certain Duchampian things he did earlier. So I think I will stop here. It gives you a very fast overview. Everything that I've shown you is in the exhibition except the construction painting that um, is next to Mervyn Larry in that second time that came on. Basically, because as the exhibition was being installed, there was just the sense that that one more painting was going to kill the elegance of the installation. And since that belonged to me, it was easy enough for us to take it out and just have it in the catalog. So they're the sorts of things that happen when you're doing exhibitions. And um, thank you for listening and happy to answer any questions. And thank you for being here. Well, thank you, Ruth and, and Bill. I hope I can call you Bill. Um, it was really fascinating to learn about uh, Larry Day, an artist that I had heard of because I know Ruth as a colleague at the National Gallery, but it's wonderful to really see the range and depth of what he has created. Now, I mean, I know this may not be fair, but because you kept saying that the everybody brings their own interpretation and Larry liked that, but I keep seeing it well, as Ruth said, sort of surreal, as mysterious, as odd, as strange structures and strange relationships. 
lighting and scale are all wonderfully off. And I'm just curious if there's any insights into how he sort of thought that through to create these sort of mysterious images, at least in my mind. I mean, they're just fabulously created. I think he thought them through at different times. I think he thought them through by drawing. Uh, drawing was clearly a way of thinking for him. Uh, and he prepared to paint. I mean, how he thought them through, he talked about preparing to go into the studio. And he prepared by, to go into the studio by listening to music that he thought was relevant by reading poetry or another form of literature that he thought was relevant, by looking at paintings or books uh, or going to the museum, uh, studying what he thought was relevant. And then that was his way of preparation. And then combining his own thinking. And he did, I mean, his, his library in terms of the humanities was, was staggering. And every book had a bookmark in it. Well, not every book, most of the books had a bookmark in it. And the bookmark was an image that, you know, he cut from a, he didn't cut up books, but he did cut up catalogs or calendars or um, probably magazines. Um, and, and used the image in the book that he felt was appropriate for that text, just as he would think of what music was appropriate for this idea. And he would have, um, and his music interests went, you know, from early medieval music to um, whatever the hottest thing at the moment was. He was a huge jazz aficionado and he would have five different albums. He would have every variation of the interpretation of the music. So he was very conscious of the possibility of interpretation being critical. And um, what's the word? Um, jazz. Um, I'm not thinking of the word. Anyway, he would have multiple translations of, of literature as well. So this consciousness that everything could be um, done in a multiple number of ways. And he didn't need to uh, like something necessarily or feel close to something. His, he, he certainly believed in chance, but for him chance came during the process, not at the beginning of the process. And one of his colleagues talked about how she invited uh, John Cage to speak at the school knowing that Larry was not particularly interested in John Cage's music because it was to the origins of chance. Uh, but she also said, but he knew more about John Cage than anybody who liked John Cage. He could teach with greater sophistication or talk of, about John Cage with more nuance yeah. than John Cage's biggest fans. Right. And so this was true in terms of his relation to the visual and, and to literature. Yeah. It's a long answer to your question, but I think it's, this is all the end. I think that's the answer, all of that. Yeah. Well, I, 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 would, I would add one little piece to that, Ruth. Um, you know, I think what's so fascinating about this exhibition for people who love art is that Larry loved the art of the past. I mean, I get the sense he was the kind of guy at the end of the day that, you know, in museums, you know, we know this. Sometimes there are people you have to tap them on the shoulder and say, I'm so sorry, but the museum is closing and I am, you know, and it's time to leave. Um, and they just don't want to leave the gallery. And I'm guessing Larry was like that. You, you mentioned his interest in frescoes and Italian painting, um, you know, Giotto, Piero della Francesca kind of come off the walls. But then his, his, there's another dimension of his taste that I think gets to what Chris is asking about. And that is his interest in mannerism. I mean, you mentioned in the painting changes, there's a, there are two mannerist paintings there. One a Northern Renaissance painting, one a, the other, the one on the left is a painting by Rosso Fiorentino, which, you know, in the 1970s, I mean, that was unusual taste. I mean, the mannerists were not, um, 
you know, they, they were not the kind of center of attention that we have. And even looking at this painting that's on this, the, this drawing, Factory, and that three-headed creature, I mean, that has to come out of like, I don't know, Pontormo or Bronzino or, you know, if, if anybody's seen the, you know, the bizarre paintings of, you know, the, the Mannerists in the Medici portrait shows right now at, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I, I can imagine a figure like that coming out of, um, you know, that kind of most fantastical, strange, sometimes disturbing kind of imagination that you get from the Mannerists. And I think part of what makes the work um, just so engaging is that quality that you're describing as surrealist. And in Larry's work, it's kind of a push and pull between this very structured kind of Piero della Francesca sort of approach. And then the Mannerists are always present in his imagination somehow to me. And you know, I think you can see it in just about any painting. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. But I just think it would be, I mean, I'm amused that he called himself a rear guard artist because I think he's really energized realism and given it a, a, a depth and a breadth that is rare to be seen among uh, contemporary artists. I think he was probably at the forefront in many ways of what he was doing. But I need to, at this point, I think wrap it up, except to thank you both for your kindness and your uh, presence in talking about Larry Day and about how wonderful and what inventive and creative an artist he is. And Bill, thank you so much for uh, your presentation and for your understanding and for your uh, explanation about Woodmere, which now I hope everybody will come to see. Please. Uh, something that I wasn't familiar with, but I've now put it onto my list when I'm in Philadelphia. Uh, having said that, let me thank you all. And on behalf of the Washington Print Club, thank everyone who came today. It was my honor to be hosting. And I hope everybody profited and learned from this wonderful talk today. Thank you all. Have a great day. Yes, thank you. Be well. Yeah.